Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here um, uh, today. Um, one of my first initiations into um, politics and the journey that I was to take was, was reading uh, Patrick McGill. And I have to say, uh, Children of the Dead End and the Rad Pits were, even to a 15-year-old, uh, very accessible. And I could sense the anger and the frustration uh, and outrage at how the structures of society, even back then, uh, had failed ordinary people. And of course, that continues right through to the day as we deal with the fallout from the uh, McCarthy report. So the question is, does Ireland need Europe? And the answer from me is, of course we do. Uh, of course we need Europe. But we need to maybe turn the question around and ask, what type of Europe do the people of Ireland and Europe need? What type of Europe do we want? What type of Europe do we subscribe to? And I proffer the suggestion that the Lisbon Treaty or the European Constitution that preceded it uh, does, not, does not fit the picture that the people of Europe uh, require. And indeed, the evidence is there. For purposes of clarity, I'll read out what my party and what I believe Europe should be. I believe that Europe should deepen meaningful democracy and meet the highest standards of accountability. I believe that Europe should protect and promote civil, political, social, economic and cultural rights. I believe that Europe should assist member states in building prosperity and equality. It should combat poverty, inequality, discrimination and social justice. It should pursue environmentally responsible and sustainable policies. It should promote conflict resolution, peace building and global stability. It should protect neutrality, oppose militarization and the arms trade. And it should assist the developing world overcome global poverty, inequality and disease. So that was the, the bar uh, that we looked at that we felt had to be uh, jumped over in order to fit the criteria. We looked at the Lisbon Treaty and it didn't fit. The European Constitution preceded the Lisbon Treaty. The Lisbon Treaty was 96% essentially of the European Constitution. And it was put to the people of France and Holland and other countries, Spain and Luxembourg. But I'll, I'll focus on France and Holland for the purposes of my point. It's pretty clear when you look at European elections that there are traditionally, particularly in recent years, low turnouts at European elections to elect members to the European Parliament. But yet in France, when they debated the European Constitution, there was a 70% turnout, a remarkable turnout. The people on the ground took ownership of the debate. They debated it in schools, in libraries, in public buildings, right throughout the length and breadth of that land. And the leadership of the senior parties in France, the leadership of civic society, united in calling for a yes vote. But something happened on the ground, in the community groups, in the trade unions, in the political parties. And remarkably, the European Constitution was rejected with a 70% turnout in that country, 55%. Uh, rejected it. Again, in Holland, the same process, uh, a 62% uh, turnout and 61% rejected it. So what did Europe do? What did Europe do? Did they say, okay, we have a crisis here. Here are two of the key European states, large populations, rejecting this proposition with a high turnout. How are we going to address that? We're going to have to go back to the drawing board. No. They went back into conference, huddled together, and kept 96% of, of the Constitution in a sleight of hand. And of course, the only reason why the Irish people voted on what was to become the Lisbon Treaty was because of Raymond Crotty's case in the mid-1980s. But Raymond Crotty challenged the constitutionality of the I think it was a single European Act at the time, and one in the Supreme Court eventually. So that is why we are unique 
and having the opportunity to vote no matter what sleight of hands happen at the higher level. So what happened in Ireland? If we look back to Nice 1, before we talk about Lisbon uh, 2008, in Nice 1 we rejected that proposition, but we were told that it was a very low turnout. You couldn't really assess our, our real desire with the turnout that we had. So in Nice 2, in 2002, we had around 53% of a turnout, and we were told that's a more accurate reflection. They voted uh, yes this time with a higher turnout, we move on. So when we came into Lisbon, the question mark was going to be about the turnout. That was always going to be a key issue, the turnout of the Irish people in that uh, referendum. And the turnout, as we know, was the same as in East 2, 53%. With 53% of the Irish people rejecting the proposition against all of the odds. Remember, similar to France, Leaders of the main political parties and of civic society called for a yes vote. And despite what they've said since, they did campaign vigorously united at certain points. And the people on the ground rejected the proposition. So here was a huge opportunity for our government, a huge opportunity for them to look what had happened in France and Holland and go back to their European partners and say, the process of ratification must stop. As you know, one member state rejecting it means it's rejected. Full stop. We need to now seriously think about this project. It's an important project. It has capacity for great good. It has the capacity to be a leader, to be a beacon to the world. But right now, it is not connecting to its people on the ground. We need to reflect. But our government didn't do that. Our government sat in their hands for a long period of time and we have now uh, legal, so-called legal guarantees which in all reality are nothing more than clarifications. Indeed, Lucinda Creighton herself in recent comments in the Dáil acknowledged that we are voting on exactly the same treaty uh, and others uh, out there. It's exactly the same, not a dot or a comma has changed. So the people wanted substantial change to the existing treaty. We wanted a better deal. We wanted a new treaty that contains the policy and political direction necessary to deliver a better Europe. A Europe that is democratic and accountable, that promotes workers' rights and protects public services. A Europe that is positive and progressive. As the global financial crisis began to unfold and the recession in Ireland deepened, we also wanted a new treaty that would challenge the failed policies of deregulation, deregulation, sorry, centralization and unfettered markets, the fingerprints of which are all over the text of the Lisbon Treaty. We wanted a new treaty that reflected the new social and economic challenges facing member states. The government has failed to deliver. Not a single full stop or comma or word has been changed in the Lisbon Treaty. The proposition that will go before the Irish people on October the 2nd will be this very same treaty that they rejected on June 12, 2008. When you brush aside all the meaningless record, rhetoric about legally binding guarantees that you have, it's nothing more than a series of clarifications and minor aspects of the Lisbon Treaty. So when we come to vote on the Lisbon Treaty in October, we will be voting on exactly the same treaty with exactly the same consequences for Ireland and the EU as we did on 12th of June 2008. The promise of retaining our Commissioner must also be questioned. The agreement by the Council of Ministers tells us we will keep our Commissioner for an unspecified time. Unless the issue is written into an EU treaty, the likely outcome is that the reduction in the size of the Commission envisioned in Lisbon will be delayed five years until the next European parliamentary elections in 2014. This is an issue of trust. Would you trust this government to deliver on any commitment, be it European or domestic matters? I certainly would not. On neutrality, the clarifications tell us that Irish troops can only be sent abroad with the consent of the Irish government in the Council of Ministers and the Oireachtas. This we already know. But neutrality is not only what you do with your troops, it is also about the alliances you form, what you do with your resources, and what other member states do in your name. 
Provisions for permanent structured cooperation in the Lisbon Treaty create the real possibility that wars we do not support will be fought in our name and with our resources. While the Mutual Defence Clause creates obligations incompatible with any internationally recognised definition of neutrality. The governments could have secured opt-outs from these contentious areas of the treaty that deal with common foreign and security policy and common security and defence policy. After their people rejected the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, the Danish government secured a number of opt-outs before putting the treaty to a second vote. With regards to taxation, the government has completely missed the point. Under the Lisbon Treaty, any move to a common corporation tax system across the EU would require a unanimous vote at the Council of Ministers. Anyone who read the treaty could tell you this. Sinn Féin's concerns on taxation rest with Article 48 of the treaty. This article allows the Council of Ministers, by unanimous decision, to alter the text of existing EU treaties. Today, if the EU wanted to agree a common corporation tax system, they would have to do so, do so as part of a broader treaty revision process. This would require both unanimity at Council or ratification in each member state, including a referendum in this state. However, Article 48 allows the Council of Ministers to make a significant change to the treaty by unanimity. EU leaders view national debates and referendums on issues of social and economic significance as cumbersome. We view such processes as fundamental tools of a functioning progressive democracy. So Lisbon does not affect, and it does affect, our tax sovereignty, but it makes it easier for the Council of Ministers to make the change in future about the inconvenience of a, res of a referendum. Again, this is an issue of trust. Fianna Fáil, despite their assurances, couldn't be trusted on this or indeed any other matter of importance, in my view, when you look at their uh, recent form. And let's remember the concerns the government have not even acknowledged the clarification. So I'll wrap up with these final few comments. There is no question of the reduced influence of smaller member states as a consequence of the new voting arrangements at Council. No mention of the 60 or so member states' vetoes that will end. No mention of the controversial changes to international trade negotiations that were opposed by farmers and trade justice groups alike. No mention of the opening up of vital public services such as health and education to the vagaries of the markets. Tonish de Mary Coughlin said recently that saying yes to Lisbon was necessary to secure Ireland's economic future. And indeed, we, we've listened to more of it uh, already today. Let's remember that the minister's former party leader and Taoiseach Bertie O'Hearn were one of the main authors of the Lisbon Treaty, with input, no doubt, from his finance minister, Brian Cowan. The minister herself has lost over 200,000 Irish jobs since becoming responsible for enterprise trade and employment. Their combined resume on economic matters is not exactly inspiring. So Ireland's place is at the heart of Europe. This is not in question. The challenge facing Ireland and Europe is to build a union that meets the needs of its people. We need a treaty that delivers a better Europe for all member state citizens. And it is in this context that Sinn Féin will continue to campaign for a better deal. Thanks for your attention.